Whitakers. Um, Andrew Whitaker reporting for duty. First, first interview about to commence. Um, I'm at the War Museum in Johannesburg, standing in front of the first rifle that was named Sarge, after the founder Sarge Nell. Um, I'm just waiting for my guest to arrive. Um, and we will be bringing you our first episode. Thank you. Good morning once again. Uh, if I could introduce my guest today, Colonel Jan Malan. And Colonel Jan Malan is, is going to give us a bit of information on the rifle. Um, possibly, Colonel or Jan, if you can just give us a little bit about yourself, possibly. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Andrew, it's uh, great to have this talk with you. Um, I'm uh, Jan Malang, I was uh, 22 years an officer in the South African Defence Force and the National Defence Force. I had the privilege for many years in Bloemfontein and at Luatla to train soldiers in uh, mechanised warfare where this vehicle comes in. Uh, I had the privilege in 1982 of being a company commander in Angola, operating out of Rahul as a uh, mechanised infantry company commander. I had the opportunity as a battalion group commander in 19, uh, January 1988 to command a whole uh, battalion or battle group with rifles in uh, Angola. And then uh, after that, I was officer commanding 8th in Uppington, where we carried on training people with rifles. So I'm quite well known with, uh, with the vehicle. Thanks, Jan. I think what we'll do is we'll start from the front and Give a bit of information yeah. on the rifle. Mm -hmm. um, I was also in, uh, I was also six one net. Uh, just for information, in nineteen eighty, I was on Operation Skeptic. Mm -hmm. uh, the rifle <laughs> I was in, as we had contact, uh, hit a tree stump and broke its wishbone or something, and we spent twenty eight hours on the on the battlefield yeah. waiting for help. But that's a, another story. Yeah. Okay, so so if we start here, I think this is the first rifle that was yeah. made. Eh? This one we're looking at is number one. And that's why it's standing there in the museum, Andrew, because we decided number one is number one after all. Yes. Uh, this vehicle came after our experience in 1975 in Angola. In that incursion in Angola, um, we were still operating with Bedfords and we were still operating with Elon uh, armor car. Here's an Elon, you can see this vehicle we, was what we had. And typically an Elon, uh, if you can come to this one, you'll see an Elon is an armor car. It only has got four wheels. It does not negotiate terrain that very well. It doesn't travel very far because they, uh, the uh, uh, diesel it uses is, is, is quite few. And, uh, but it's got a devastating punch with a, with a 90 mm gun. That's that what is not. And, and out of this came a requirement to build a vehicle. But you will remember during those times, we, we were in a situation where we had sanctions against South Africa. We couldn't buy vehicles. We had to manufacture vehicles. So the South African Army started a whole uh, exercise to develop a vehicle that would be able to work with tanks on a battlefield because mechanized infantry operates on a mechanized base with tanks on a battlefield. So you've got to keep up to, to uh, tanks. Now a tank obviously has tracks. So the question was do we go for tracks or for wheels? And we decided wheels is the thing because of our distance, because we've got extreme long distances and tanks cannot run on tar roads forever and a day. And you've got to transport your, your force. You've got to uh, put your force in it where you where you need. And that's why the Rato was developed. It was also developed to put a section of infantry in. In other words, 10 infantrymen with a driver. That's why we have 11 people operating from a Rato. And this is where this, this came from. So it is built of armored steel, South African uh, products, South African manufactured. We started training. Then, and obviously then when the, when the uh, war came, we had to adjust. And because the mechanized infantry were the mobile force they were used in Southwest, uh, now Namibia, and in Southern Angola to that extent. Okay, now the vehicle comprises, and let's go to this side, the vehicle comprises of a, of a, uh, a hull that is pretty steel, 20 millimeter armor plating in front, you see it's shaped so that it would uh, 
Bounce off, deflect. deflect any project bounce. If you can look at this side, you see it's got it's six wheels. The we decided to mount the engine, a bushing uh, at the back. I'm going to show you that uh, just now to protect the driver. We decided to put the driver right in the middle. These plates, the driver could pull a lever because if the shots came this side, he could flip up these plates to protect him just above. The uh, armor uh, glass, he would have a driver sight that he could actually sit in. The turret fits in the middle. It is the same size and shape as you can see the 90 mil turret. And it was a very good decision because we could fit the turret on a vehicle. So we could fit 20 mil if it was an infantry section. We could fit a 60 mil if it was for a, a platoon commander. We could fit a 90 mil if it was for our anti-tank. We could put it a 12,7 on for our command vehicles. So this was a, an, an excellent decision. You will see that uh, although we started off this way with uh, protecting the lights and the flickers because you've got to you've got to run on, on on tar roads. Once this thing hits the bush and you cannot stay on the roads and you've got a bundu bash, this all gets ripped off. So in the later versions, we got we used steel plates around all these, adjusted everything because if you go through stick thick bush, it even takes off everything on the inside. Okay, so the driver sits here. Now let me show you where the crew commander and his crew sits. Right, um, we are now on top of the rifle, and I'm going to show you now the uh, layout and what it has. We know the driver sitting in front. This is the turret of the commander. You will see the vision blocks. I'm standing in the turret of a Rattle 20, the typical position of a section leader, uh, a corporal that would uh, position himself here. His driver in front, over here his gunner, and his crew sitting at the back. Okay, this position is the command position. That's why we put uh, sights here so that the commander could have all sight vision once his hatch were closed and if it's open he gets protected against the bush and can easily go in here. This is the, dry, the gunner position. In between you'll see the 20mm gun and the coaxial browning machine gun. So you've got the 20 mm gun and the coaxial browning machine gun. What we had was also a proper Search light, and then on the sides, as you can see there and here, the smoke canisters that could be launched once you have to withdraw out of a uh, enemy uh, out of enemy fire. And over here are the the points where our antennas would be, because so in the here radios. at the back of the turret would be the three radios. Okay. The section would have one radio because that speaks on the platoon level. The platoon commander would have. Two radios, his uh, radio down to his, his three vehicles and the radio up to the high headquarters. In a command vehicle, you'd have more radios. Yeah. That's why we had to wear a wear headset and a chest box so that you could actually change between these radios. Yeah. And you had to keep your, your head yeah. quite, okay. quite clear. And, and that if, is a bin. I was going to say, if I remember correctly, the pots and pans went in the bin at the back there. Yeah, yeah. Here's a bin and on the sides, I'll show you now. Yeah. Because we had to carry everything, obviously, that yeah. you had to carry for, for fighting here. Then going to the back of the vehicle, let me show you this. Over here are the hatches. These hatches can stand in the open position, closed position or drop down position. Now if you're an infantry man, a mechanized infantry soldier, you would obviously be able to fight from inside because there are ports where you can stick your R4, uh, R1 through to shoot, okay, or you could stand up here and you could protect yourself or you could drop that if necessary, if you had to throw a hand grenade or whatever uh, to that side. Okay, and then let's look at the back here. If we turn that out. Right, at the back, these are the hatches and inside is the bushing uh, machine. If you ask any uh, South African mechanized soldier, the sound of a bushing 
in the bush is absolutely brilliant. Very, very reliable machine. You could actually pull it out in, in a few minutes, yes. drop another one in, fix it up. This position here was for the last rifleman that was trained as an anti-aircraft gunner. It had a turret on here for a light of a low-flying aircraft. And you can even see the, bin, the uh, bins for more ammunition uh, for a normal 762. Um, uh, yeah, I, I wasn't anti-aircraft trained, but I spent a bit of time in the back. Extremely hot there. Extremely hot here. Yeah. Ab absolutely right. Yeah. You can, you can stop it, yeah? Right, let's go. Okay, I'm sitting in the back of a Rattle 20, and it was built with the infantrymen sitting here, three next to each other, with their backs towards each other, facing outwards. So, what an infantryman could do was to observe through the vision block, and everyone has a vision block, as you can see, if they need to shoot during the fight. Here's the racks where the uh, R1 or R4 rifles would be, would be placed. Here is the space where all the extra ammunition was, was, uh, was loaded. And then all he had to do was to either open this port, put his rifle through and he could shoot through here, looking at the battlefield, or move up here and obviously shoot from there. So this was the position that the, the guys, uh, the, 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 the riflemen would sit. Then you'll see on the inside, the inside was painted green. After a lot of study, it was found that the green color is the most important color for a calm atmosphere, okay? Inside the vehicle. You would also see here, we had a light, we had a red light and a white light that could be used. We had uh, fire extinguishers on board that could be activated if a fire happens on the inside. And obviously, if this gets hit, that's a very, very good possibility. And then, fascinating, if you start shooting, the cartridges go out to the right, and with the riflemen are sitting here. So these flaps were, sit, were, were positioned here to, 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 to deflect those onto the ground. And these rosters that you can see here, was put in so that the cartridges can land there and that you're not sliding on all those empty cartridges. So a lot of thought went into doing this uh, correctly. So the whole idea was, was that if you have to uh, debus, the commander would give a command, prepare to debus. Everybody would have their kit on, get their rif uh, uh, rifle ready, every ammunition on board, water on board, ready and the two uh, uh, riflemen sitting here would operate the two doors so if you stop fire belt action doors open the infantry would uh, would get out okay on that side and this side and immediately uh, the we could carry on in the fight it was possible to close the doors electronically by the driver um, yeah. okay so we had full control the section commander could either stay in the turret or could debust with the troops. If there was any chance of the vehicle moving away and the infantry on their own, he would be out. If, if he was still in command, he would use the firepower of his vehicle and his infantry on the outside. So typically, if you had to start trench clearing or whatever, they would, uh, he would debust and, and that would uh, carry on from there. Yeah. And, and I suppose the, the huge benefit, as opposed to just an on-foot attack, was the, the support fire of the 20 mil and the... And the Browning. And the Browning, yeah. And the Browning, because you know, if you're on the ground there, you only have a few shots. Yeah. And we taught our riflemen to use those shots very, very sparsely. Yeah. If you, if you did see the enemy, obviously, a double tap. Chip, chip, take him out. That's it, two shots. If you don't see him, then one shot in an area where you believe the enemy is to see if he's there yeah. but no wastage of ammunition just shooting yeah. every shot counts and that came to training 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 to be marksmen and you will remember yeah. most of our riflemen were excellent marksmen yeah. no, absolutely yeah what is a platoon? okay so um there were a rifle was a section yeah 
right? That's and the smallest fighting element. Yeah, so, and that's that, one and that section. And the corporal has its... That's a corporal. That's got yeah. two stripes here. That's a corporal. Yeah. He had one lance corporal. That's yeah. one stripe that would sit at the back here. That's his second in command. That's it was a section leader. That's because right. on yeah. that level, you are leading men. Yeah. Okay? And they've got one rattle. This is it. If the next level is a platoon, a platoon as a commander. So that's where an yeah. officer, a lieutenant would be. Yeah. He would have his own rattle with his own crew, with a mortarman in, a 60 millimeter mortar, yeah. and even a, a 60 mil mortar in the turret. Okay. And he would command three sections. Yeah. That means that the platoon had four vehicles. Then the next level was a company. That was a company commander in command. That's a major. His second in command is a captain with three stars. And they obviously commanded three platoons. So that's 14 vehicles. Four plus four plus four plus that's, four. Plus that's two. the two commands. That's right. Yeah. I think from my recollection, your platoon um, commander's rattle had a signaler and yeah. a, a medic and that's correct. those sort of things. That's so, exactly, that's yeah. a little platoon headquarters. Yeah. That's where your, your medic sits, yeah. where your signaler sits and your mortarman. Yeah, okay. 100%. Yeah. The platoon's second in command was a platoon sergeant. Yeah, that's correct. Okay? Yeah. In our world, also a corporal. Yeah. He drove in one of the other vehicles because they must be able to take over. And obviously, if the commander's vehicle gets taken out, you've got to be in another vehicle. Yeah. Okay, the whole issue of logistics. Now that's where our other non-commissioned officers would fit in. A company sergeant major, okay, would have would be in, responsible for that. He would have his own rattle, and then logistical vehicles, which is the supplies. Nee? Yeah. I mean, these guys have to eat, so you've got to have food there, rat packs, uh, wet rations means you've got onions and meat yeah. and uh, 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 vegetables, but that was very, very scarce. Yeah. <laughs> or dry rations would mean you have a rat pack or a ration pack yeah. that, you, that they would supply. These uh, vehicles use uh, water, so you're going to have water. They use diesel, so you had diesel bowsers, and uh, they need spares. So the tiffies, we call them the tiffies, the, the technical mechanics, support, yeah. Yeah. they had a vehicle like this, but their vehicle was fitted with a, a, a jig on the front so that they could pull you out that with other supplies. And and they would do repairs in a bat, on the battlefield if we on were move. moving on the move. They would get hook up this vehicle, not get left behind or lost in the bush, while you are moving forward, they would repair. Once they repair, stop, jump off into their own vehicle, unhook the vehicle, off you go, uh, section vehicle ready to, 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 to fire. The Tiffies were brilliant because you can think if you have a vehicle like this and you break down, there's nowhere you can go in the Angolan bush yeah, to absolutely. have it. You, have it. you have to have your own ability and yeah. that we were brilliant, brilliant with. And I think, yes, from my side, uh, I think that was often the, the unrecognized. Yeah. Um, I had a call from one of the three two guys this morning, uh, Peter Williams. Yeah. And we were just chatting, and I was saying, you know, like, I was on Operation Skeptic Smoke Show, and we've got lots of brothers that, on a WhatsApp group and, and all the rest. But there are a lot of people that we never knew about. The helicopter yeah. choppers. Yeah. They did an the amazing pilots. job. Yeah. But we don't even know who they yeah. are. Even the technicians uh, behind them, even the tiffies behind them. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And, you know, so, yeah, and I think probably didn't get the recognition that they, yeah. they deserved. Absolutely. I just want to go back to the, the um, platoon commander, section leaders. Um, and I know things changed after my time. But I'm right in saying that the, the lieutenant, platoon commander, and the platoon sergeant had gone off to Oatson and done officer's course, and then they joined us? No, no. Initially, that was the idea, but when mechanized infantry was thought out and the rattle came to being, the, it was decided to train those guys in Bloemfontein. Yeah. And that's where the mechanized leader wing 
Yes, but I, which, I, think, we're it, I think that started in 1980, 79. Uh, that's when the first guys that's came in, yeah. I trained them, that's because right. they came okay. and the mechanized yeah. leader wing started, okay. and everybody was trained there, so they were selected, they did not go to Oatsville, oh, okay. they went to, to, to uh, we had it at the Tempe yeah. Tigers at that uh, okay. point where right. it was situated, yeah. and they were trained there, and then uh, on Bloemfontein, and obviously in the unit, the Drivers were trained on a driver course, yes. the gunners on a gunner's yeah. course, the section commanders on their yeah. course. And then you have to, in the next phase, so it's basic training, then specialist training. In specialist training, you get your training as a driver. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Or as a gunner, or a yeah. chef for that matter, or whatever. But then, when you do your section training, then you bring a group together of a section commander, or a leader in our case, a section leader, section 2IC, the rifleman, a driver, a gunner, and that section becomes a unit. Yeah. That's the smallest unit, and they operate in this unit. That's right, yeah. And here we are sitting today many years after the time. And I can tell you the bonds happened in this vehicle. Yeah. Because it's here yeah. that the guys got one group. No. This group will be a group like brothers forever. No. No, not Even gonna... in heaven we're going to sit and yeah. discuss this because this was where the bond, the real bond, were, were yeah. formed in these vehicles. No, absolutely, I can I can agree with that one hundred percent. Yeah, so I think we've seen the inside, we've seen the front. Maybe we must just go and look around the back, yeah. and yeah, let's do it. Right, and we're standing on the outside of the vehicle now, and um, obviously when it's closed, it locks itself it's in, in this position. Now you will see that the tires were special tires. And these were fitted to protect the, the, the tires. We, of course, we had to run on this. And if this gets hit, then you stand. Yeah. The vehicle, obviously, if you hit the back one, it will carry on. But we used run flat tires, so you could shoot it, it would carry on. Okay, where every vehicle had a spare tire on the back, hooked up with the camouflage net. So you could camouflage this vehicle. And obviously, if you want to repair a vehicle, you have to jack it up, take off that uh, hub, get the wheel on top, get the other one fitted, and uh, it would take uh, five or seven minutes to do that, and you would be, you would be operational again. Um, over here, you would see a bin. These bins would be opened, and supplies would be put in there. You will remember all the extra rat tanks and everything when it went, uh, went in here. It's interesting, it's something I've never even noticed when I was there, but the door has a port and a... Oh yes, because, you, because you can actually sit here on the inside yeah. and shoot through. Yeah. So it's quite possible to do it because you yeah. can sit here and shoot through here. And you could lock this, obviously. Yeah, you just the same, the, yeah. 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 Uh, the same for everything. This is a very interesting thing here. <laughs> this, if you will remember, it's called a tow bar. Now this tow bar obviously enables one vehicle to tow the other one into or outside and out of battle. And very important, it also help, very helpful if troops don't listen. <laughs> and you know, they drive the gun and to report with their tow bar yeah. so that they don't uh, get of course, of course the troops had other ways of doing it. Uh, no, obviously. We drop the table on the bush and borrow one on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> I realize, I realize that. I, I realize that. Let's move around the back. Okay, just position yourself there. You can edit this out. Okay, uh, we stand. At the hind side of the of our house, and you can see obviously the, the uh, engine, hatch. engine hatch is open, which would obviously be closed. Uh, this hatch is the inspection hatch for the driver to actually get to his, to his engine, where all the fluids is uh, for, for uh, operating the, the vehicle. The uh, air, uh, there is no lucht filter in Engels. The air filter. The air filter. Yeah. On, on the inside, um, it also had a crowbar. a crowbar. And then this very interesting uh, part of the equipment is spades, shovels, and then this little instrument, which you take out because if you have a short driver, you cannot fit 
here. Cannot reach here. So we would use that little stem to reach here. And it also doubled up as a rye rooster. Because South African troops love rye in the field. So that uh, doubled up for that. On this side here, you will, you will see there is a uh, filling point for water. Okay, and a tap. And we could put this side and that side a lot of water. And if I remember correctly, 40 liters on each side. So you had water available at, uh, at all times. Then, important in convoy movement. Okay, you'll have to come down here and show you. This instrument was very important because during convoy movement you don't use light. But you've got to be able to see the vehicle in front of you. And we had a lot of that because we were forced to do night movement, night attacks. So this indicates to the next vehicle where you are with a little light that you could follow this vehicle yeah. at night through the thick bush. And obviously we also gave the drivers night vision equipment, uh, night goggles that they could actually drive without any light to see where they were going. Yeah. Yeah, no, this will work very well. They even have a loose <laughs> down here. Just going to move the turret to get into. Oh, yes. I'm now sitting in the commander seat, and you can see it's pretty cramped, okay, where the commander of a, a rattle would sit. He's a branding machine gun, 20 mil gun. This is the seat where his uh, gunner would sit. And behind him, the positions where the radios would be fitted inside the vehicle. In the middle here is the bins and uh, the 20 millimeter ammunition feeds in the middle. And you could choose between armor piercing and uh, anti-personnel ammunition. And in these two bins here would be extra ammunition for the 20 mil. And in here would be all the browning boxes. So uh, very well worked out uh, how to operate in this turret. I'm sitting in the driver's seat of a Rattle 20, looking through the vision blocks. And you can see the driver had excellent vision, sitting in the middle of the vehicle, in the center. Uh, with his steering wheel here and then obviously this uh, is his pedals he operates his uh, automatic diesel 12 uh, cylinder machine okay um, here is all his uh, equipment and his uh, meters where you could actually uh, switch everything on and off control everything from here uh, in, inside his vehicle indicating fuel and uh, power here was the gearbox where you could actually change to automatic uh, or, or if you needed uh, to do it manually you could do it from here On this side over here is the the brake these are the air brakes in the vehicle and here you could actually change uh, your your settings to everything locked six by six, four by six, uh, with uh, all the wheels pulling together. Then uh, over here would be the meter indicating speed. And then this was the trip master. And this very interesting, small little useful <laughs> instrument assisted largely in the bush. We were in a scenario in the 70s and 80s where we did not have GPS available. So we would do dead reckoning with compasses and then you, we would put uh, white toilet paper on a tree and everybody would pass that and that would be the starting point. And then what the driver would do is he just zero his trip, okay? And it would show zero, zero, zero and then there we go. And if you needed to know where any vehicle was, he would just say I'm at 2.5 or 3.6. And that indicates where you are on that line of advance. Uh, and you could even shoot uh, artillery, you could shoot mortars, so accurate this was. 
So this little instrument, the trip master, was really a very important part of what we had available in a rattle. So, so the name rattle? Uh, yeah, it was a name because every vehicle has a name yeah. um, in the military because it just makes it easy for reference purposes. And rattle is a badger in English. Yeah. Uh, now, those of you that know animals will know it's the most uh, battle-hardened little animal. Lion can attack it, hyenas can attack it, wild dogs can attack it. They, they always fight back. These little rascals are the toughest we know. And that's why we call this rattle. And I think it was very, very appropriate. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, thanks, Jan. I think we've probably done enough for today. Uh, thank you for taking part. And for the viewers out there, um, till we meet again, thank you.